Welcome to Study Buddy, meditation philosophy for the heart of your practice. This is a live online discussion of ancient yogic texts amongst meditation practitioners in the Shambhavananda yoga tradition. My name is Acharya Satyam, a resident teacher at Konalani Yoga Ashram in Hawaii, and I welcome you with love and respect. Welcome. It's it's a big day. It's the day that we actually do, uh, we break into the dharanas, the actual practices we've been leading up to for eight classes. Um, it's, and eight is an understatement, I think. It's just been, it's been weeks and weeks of work. And uh, guess what? We're not going to jump right into it. We're actually going to build up to it somehow, still. Yeah, over the, no, it, over the next eight minutes. Um, but the idea is, that uh, I wanted to take a moment to look at Paul Rep's introduction to Zen Flesh and Bones. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the word dharana means, uh, sort of the in its context, uh, also from Patanjali's perspective. Um, and then after we do look at the first dharana and sit with it, I uh, want to open the door and explain a little bit uh, about like the 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 idea of using multiple translations and sort of how this is actually a text that we will discuss um so so there's a lot to go over but we will guaranteed will have the first darn to happen tonight so with that um hopefully everybody's available for uh unmuting occasionally to read that would be awesome and um i wanted to start by looking at paul reps's uh, introduction to the Vigyana Bhairava. As you probably know, this is the preferred translation, it, to my understanding, for Babaji and Faith. Um, they were dear friends with Paul Reps. Paul Reps is obviously an incredible practitioner, um, but it should be known that Paul Reps uh, studied alongside Lakshmanju on this translation. And so in, in, in a way, it's almost like all of these translations are peer. It's like a group of peers um, and sort of giving it their look but you know i have a really fond base in my heart for paul reps um so we're going to see how he introduces the sutra uh or introduces the dharanas um and chaitanya i can't help but call on you because yeah he plugged his envelope and bones in the meditation training this is something he's reading so um if you want to give it's this slide and there'll be one more after it Intro to the Jnana Bhairava by Paul Reps. Can you hear me? Okay. It is an ancient teaching, copied and recopied countless times, and from it, Lakshman Ju has made the beginnings of an English version. I transcribe it 11 more times to get it into the form given here. Shiva first chanted it to his consort Devi in a language of love we have yet to learn. It is about the imminent experience. It presents 112 ways to open the invisible door of consciousness. I see Lakshman Ju give his life to its practice. Some of the ways may appear redundant, yet each differs from any other. Some may seem simple, yet anyone requires constant dedication even to test it. Machines, ledgers, dancers, athletes, balance. Just as centering or balance augments various skills, so it may awareness. As an experiment, try standing equally on both feet. Then imagine you are shifting your balance slightly from foot to foot. Just as balance centers do you. Thank you, Chaitanya. Uh, radiant voice of yours. Well, you know we're going to do that exercise so everybody can stand up. And uh, this will... Oh, you could do it. But Rep says stand. Okay, if you don't want to stand, definitely don't. Uh, I just try to do what Rep says sometimes. So we're just going to uh, stand equally on both feet. Then start shifting your balance slightly from foot to foot. 
So this is actually a practice we do seated, Abaya mentioned. Um, ah, but it feels good to stand actually. And Reps is saying, take your time from going from foot to foot, but notice, it's okay. Just take your time going from foot to foot, but notice as you become centered on both feet, when both feet are holding up equally, when you're balancing equally on both feet, you yourself become centered. As you center between your feet, you yourself become centered. Excellent. And then we'll come back down to our seat. So sorry if that was no, a little annoying to get up and down, but we can do it from our seat as we settle. So sit bone to sit bone, take your time getting there, of course. And we do this one a lot together. But as you balance between both sit bones, as you center between your sit bones, you are centered. So reps helps us uh, see in such an incredibly poetic way um, that these physical practices have a, they, they translate to an energetic experience that we're not just balancing on our feet and then all, and then we're just physically balanced, but that there's a, that all the layers come with it, all the layers center with it. So each one of these dharanas, each one of these practices is sort of just like balancing on two feet, taking your time and then feeling not just your body center, but you center. Some of the ways may appear redundant, yet each is different from every other one in that it requires constant dedication to even test it. And that's really what this class is for. It's to give us time to dedicate to testing it. Babaji always reminds us that yoga is a scientific uh, undertaking. The original texts of yoga called the Vedas literally translate to meaning the science. And testing a practice is, is how you practice. It's not like not believing in it. It's actually believing in it very deeply. And then just to look back at this other paragraph, uh, this one always catches me here. Uh, a language of love we have yet to learn. You know, interpret that in the way that you would like. Chanted it to his consort, Devi, in a language of love we have yet to learn. You know, when Babaji talks about bliss, when the sutras talk about bliss, it's it's always coupled with the statement that it's beyond words. You know, and um, I would imagine that this experience, this 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 conversation, and that they're sharing is 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 just like that. Excellent. So, any comments or questions there on Paul Rep's introduction to the Vigyana Bhairava? Right. So, the word Dharna. Have, have raise your hand if you've encountered that in before you know you have a rough idea you might be able to say like i sort of i can i can define it pretty let's hear it who wants can somebody define it in your own words just for fun don't be shy oh, i see jatila looking at char Look. <laughs> So I don't know if that means Shar is going to do it or Jatila is trying to get the okay, but go for it, Jatila or Shar. Isn't Dharna, doesn't, it means concentration in the eight limbs, doesn't it? Wow. Ding, ding, ding. Yep, that's it. I don't even need to show you guys the next slide. So yeah, constant, it, the direct translation, concentration, Dharna, a, a way of concentrating and focusing. And as Jatila said, uh, it, we have seen this a lot in the eight limbs of yoga is presented by Patanjali. It's the sixth limb. So it's, it's up there. It takes a while to work up to this. 
And I pulled um, that section of the sutras, the yoga sutras out uh, because Patanjali is, uh, he's really good at, um, well, I, I mean, I'm not going to say like, I know what he's good and not good at because he obviously was an advanced practitioner, but from my experience, um, he, he really is able to simplify and, and, and very clearly these terms in a way that makes it easy to discuss. So let's go ahead and read through how Patanjali describes the word dharana. And then he goes on to talk about the seventh and eighth limbs because they're all sort of related. Um, Gita, would you be available for this one? Oh, yeah. Dharna or concentration is the act of fixing the mind on one thing. Here there is a perceived separation between the object and the practitioner. Dhyana or meditation is when the focus of dharana becomes steady, uninterrupted flow of attention. Here the separation between the practitioner and the object dissolves. All right, one more page. Samadhi is when in the practice of dhyana, both the practitioner and the object of focus dissolve into the self. Then there is no such thing as a practitioner or object, only absorption in the self. These three limbs are grouped together because the difference between them is very slight. They may not all happen in a clear sequence, and they may intermingle. Together, they compromise a practice called sanyama, or integration. Excellent. Thanks, Gita. So we see a very familiar path where dharana is going to give us a horizontal object to focus, right? Something that we can, the act of fixing the mind on one thing. And interestingly enough, when you have this object you're focusing on, you might not realize it, but there's an implied separation between you and this object. You are focusing on this thing in front of you or this practice that you're, you're working with. Um, and so there is a separation. There is a, a difference. Now, what do we see in the preface all the time? That the state we're seeking is a state of non-difference, right? That's the ultimate state, a state of non-difference. So this is not where we stop, but it is where we stop start. And so dhyana meditation, as Patanjali puts it, is when that focus on this practice is uninterrupted, it becomes a flow of awareness. And here's where the separation begins to blur. For example, if you repeat a mantra, you know, um, enough times, um, Babaji says that the mantra starts almost repeating itself that there doesn't appear to be this external thing, this mantra that you are saying because you're different than the mantra, but that it seems to accumulate its own energy. Um, and so that is uh, continuing us on that path. And then eventually this concept of samadhi is when there is no uh, difference whatsoever between the practice that you're doing and yourself. Um, and so that would that would be a state of being. That would be a state that is beyond words, and it would be an actual the state of undifferentiated awareness, like we see uh, in the preface a lot, the Bhagavad Bhairava. And then Patanjali wraps this concept up by saying, "These three concepts, hey Ria, these three concepts are they intermingle. Um, it's not really clear when one thing happens and another. And you could have you could be sitting there doing mantra, and it starts flowing." And then suddenly a thought comes up and it gets clunky again. And you, you know, you're having, you know, it does, it's not a linear approach. They intermingle, they overlap, but just knowing that they um, all exist can sometimes help us uh, put one foot in front of the other in our practice to just sort of have a sense of where we're going. And so, of course, this is, has been really the focal point of the entire preface of Shiva trying to say, hey, techniques are just the doorway they're not the destination we need them we need a technique to calm our mind we need a technique to help us sort of like feel like we're making progress but it would be a shame to stop there right so so the very the word are in itself implies um, a practice but it also implies 
this concept of going beyond the technique. Cool. Any questions popping up for anyone? All right. So we are going to move into the uh, the dharanas. They they start with a little um, something from Shakti from Devi, and then there's a reply from Shiva, which is the actual practice that we're going to do together for a little while, and then we'll talk a little more about it. Marcella, do you want to read this next slide for us? Devi says. Oh Shiva, what is your reality? What is this wonder-filled universe? What constitutes seed? Who centers the universal wheel? What is this life beyond form pervading forms? How may we enter it fully above space and time, names and descriptions? Let my doubts be cleared. Excellent. And then you can read for us uh, Shiva's reply, which is the first dharana. Oh. Shiva replies, Devi, though already enlightened, has asked the foregoing questions so others through the universe might receive Shiva's instructions. Now follow Shiva's reply, giving the 112 ways. One, radiant one, this experience may dawn between two breaths. After breath comes in or down and just before turning up, out, the beneficence. Thanks, Marcella. So let's sit with this for a moment. <clears throat> Radiant one. This experience may dawn, remember that word dawn, it takes practice for something to dawn, between two breaths. After the breath comes in, as it goes down, and just be before turning up and going out. So feel that downward path of the inhale. And then feel the turn and the exhale travels up and out. To my understanding, Paul Rep's translation seems to be emphasizing the point that's in the heart. He says, after the breath comes in, down. So after that inhale and going in and down, that would land you in the heart. And just before turning up, out would still be in the heart. So you're allowing your awareness to center in the heart as you feel the inhale coming down and the exhale going out. As we will see later in the interpretations of this dharana, it is the pulsation of the breath that we're really trying to feel. Having the focal point of the heart allows your awareness to settle and you can feel the inhale coming in and down the exhale going up and out, and you can look at it from this vantage point, from this single point. And 
and the singular experience we're given through Rep's translation is that of beneficence. Beneficence. A state of nourishment of benefiting endlessly. Allow yourself to feel and focus on the movement of the breath to feel both aspects, the inhale and the exhale, occurring around this center point of the heart. Allow them to come and go while you remain in this point between them. For this last moment, let yourself focus on this word again, beneficence, to feel yourself benefiting endlessly and infinitely from this practice. Can allow the spine to move a little bit, shoulders and neck roll with you. And let's take two minutes to just reflect on your initial experience of the first dharana. And of course, there's more to discuss, but be with it, you know. Trust your experience and let yourself write about it for just a couple minutes.
about 30 seconds. And if you can, finishing your thought. So I've done plenty of talking up to this point. I'd love to hear from any of you on your initial reflections. Doesn't have to be profound. Could just be like, where did that land for you? And uh, and we just take it from there. Anyone in here? I can put the mic on in here. Otherwise, un feel free to unmute. Sure, as I see a hand from Bob. Yeah. Um, having practice hamsa for a long time. Um, I told myself the pauses in the breath sneak up on you. Merely stopping the breath with your will is not the same thing. The surprise mm -hmm. of recognizing the stillness is the door to joy. That last sentence is the door. The surprise of recognizing the surprise of recognizing the stillness is the door to joy. Oh, wow. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I really, I agree. I feel like there is a element to this practice of surprise and of trying to let something happen to you or come to you that really, like you put it so well, is is the fun part, you know, the door to joy. It's like the thing that um, really makes it, it feels like it's really alive, it's happening. So thank you for that, that was really sweet. Anyone else wanna chime in on their initial reflections on the first dharana? Sure, Gita. Oh, uh, mine was a somewhat similar to Bob's in that I had this, uh, um, at the start, my mind was too involved. I kept waiting to feel beneficence rather than to relax and let it mm -hmm. sneak up and surprise me. Mm -hmm. um, once I started to relax, it, it, the whole thing changed, but for me, it really showed the pattern of my habits of overthinking. Mm. Thanks, Gita. Yeah, I can really feel the difference, you know, in just the idea of like pursuing the word beneficence uh, and then the, the feeling of like, well, what would that feel like? What does beneficence feel like? And it just sort of allowing it to sort of bubble up as an experience. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's also referencing Paul Rep's uh, note at the beginning that it takes diligent practice to even test these because obviously two, five minutes isn't a lot, but it just shows you how many layers there are to these experiences. Yogita, yeah. I don't know why we call it watching the breath because it's feeling the breath and it's not just feeling the breath in your nose and eye chakra and heart, but it's feeling in your whole body and, and, and you feel it going in and out. And <laughs> I really, I just came from the beach and I, it's like waves. The breath is like waves washing over you, bringing in the new energy and taking out the old. And I, I just get awesome. I really get into this feeling the breath and hearing, feeling and hearing. Excellent. Yeah, you, I, I, I could not agree with you more. 
I could not agree with you. I feel like you really um, articulated that perfectly. The watching is uh, does almost bring us up into our eyes, up into our head, up into our thoughts, whereas feeling almost always brings us down into our body and, you know, closer to our heart and just out of our thoughts a little bit. And even hearing, even though it's up here, you know, when you're listening, you're in a real receptive state. You, you don't want to project, you want to receive. And so hearing and feeling the breath, I think are really productive terms um, for meditating on the breath. So thank you. I'll probably start using those terms. It's, you know, I think you're just spot on. Well, thanks. That was, you know, we're just tapping into it. We're going to sit with that again later. Um, I wanted to just break in to the dharnas and sort of break the ice. But I will say even uh, for the next, you know, few minutes uh, before we go back in to our practice, you know, let this be an experience of like, what does it feel like to try to keep that awareness in the heart and to allow the breath flow and to make this experience that we're having right now more beneficial to you? How to make any experience more beneficial would be this point. So when we initially decided to do the Vigyana Bhairava text, I was like excited and simultaneously confused as how to have a class on it, uh, one sentence at a time. Um, and I'm sure we can, and we will continue to use Paul Rep's translations, which are very concise, realizing that there are Jai Deva Singh and Swami Lakshman Ju, who again, Rep's, you know, worked with uh, on his translations, um, have uh, translated it I don't know how to put it. It's I would not use the word thorough because reps is perfectly thorough, but it, there's just a lot of um, subtleties that can be derived out of each dharna. And this first one is a great example. Um, so we're going to look at Jai Deva Singh's translation and he does it very much word for word. And so that actually gives you a chance to see like, if this uh, was not maybe distilled down, like what might it look like? Um, Swami Lakshmanju uh, also works with that sort of larger translation of each dharana, but then he has more of a, a, a discussion about the dharana. And so between the three of them, we have this incredible compilation of resources. One, Jai Deva Singh, very exact, precise, defining. Swami Lakshmanju, conversational, putting the concepts a little bit more, you know, helping us picture it. And then reps, really giving you that concise gem that you can really meditate with, you know, uh, and, and, and keep in your pocket or in your heart, you know, throughout the day and in your practice. So it's a trifecta that really uh, looks like the between the three of them, we have this incredible path forward. So I wanted to just... Uh, I guess I, I'll say it again, break the ice again, and just look at this same dharana uh, as translated by Jai Deva Singh. And we're gonna, you're going to see like, ooh, that is, uh, is that the same dharana? Um, it, and it is. Each one is best. Um, Jaya, are you in a position to read? I know sometimes it's quiet hour at your place. Thanks. Um, just do it. Okay, here we go. So it's long. Take your time with it. This is... So, this is Dharana one. Para Devi, or highest Shakti, who is of the nature of Bizarga, goes on ceaselessly expressing herself upward, Urtave, from the center of the body to Dvasanta, or a distance of 12 fingers, in the form of exhalation, Prana, and downward, Adha from Dvadasanta to the center of the body in the form of inhalation, jiva or apana. By steady fixation of the mind, paranat, at the two places of their origin, the center of the body 
in the case of prana and the vadashanta in the case of the apana, there is the situation of plentitude, paritashtiti, which is the state of parashakti or nature of Bhairava. Excellent job. I know that was a lot. Thank you so much. That was great. So we can see simultaneously how valuable Rep's translation is and how valuable this translation is. They both have incredible benefits. Um, we're going to go through this little by little, and I'm not going to rush it. We're not going to try to get through anything tonight. We're just going to sort of chip away and just stop where we stop. And there's so much more to come. Um, but uh, we're going we're gonna to just start sort of the conversation looking at some of these, this longer interpretation. Um, so let's look at this uh, and break it down a little bit. Para Devi, or highest Shakti. It says, who is of the nature of Visarga? Pause. What's Visarga? Right? Uh, we're going to talk about that, but just curious. Anyone who doesn't live in India know what Visarga means? Okay, cool. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Chaitanya. If you know what it means, cool. I, I, I don't know if it's, a, if it's a Sanskrit thing only or if it's also in Hindi. I don't know, but you can make... Raise your hand if you want to explain it. Otherwise, we'll 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 look at it together. Okay. All right. So Visarga, y'all know this concept better than you think. So there's Om Nama. Oh yeah, I'll bring it up. Sorry, I have to constantly do things for people in the room and people online. So give me one sec. This is the the Devanagri for Om Nama Shivaya. Om Nama Shivaya. The Sarga is right here. It's these two dots, this, this colon, so to speak. Um, and this, when you say Nama, is that breath, Nama, or sometimes Namaha. Uh, and it's after uh, many different vowels in Sanskrit, um, though I do my best to study as we go and, you know, pronunciation and everything for years. I'm no scholar, but, you know, we know these kinds of terms, namah, shivaya. So it's this breath. So this breath here um, is, is, is somehow related to shakti, according to the text. Somehow understanding this colon is actually going to give us a, 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 a glimpse, help us understand uh, sh what Shakti is and how it relates to us in our true nature. Well, there's two dots. The top dot uh, is meant to represent where the, um, the sort of finishing point of your exhalation. And the bottom dot is sort of meant to represent the finishing point of your inhalation. And we see this over here in the text when it says, uh, the nature of Visarga goes on ceaselessly expressing yourself upward from the center of the body to Dwara Shanta, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, a distance of 12 fingers from the tip of the nose in the form of the exhale. So this is pretty fun. 12 fingers, two at a time. Bring them up to your nose. Make sure you're going at the angle of your nose and not straight out but the angle of your nose. And so you got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and then just put your finger right there. Actually, you can put your whole palm right there. Breathe with a little bit of force. And you should you can probably feel your breath, I would think. Now, we're not supposed to breathe with force per se, but this is just supposed to say that this is the finishing point of your exhale. It's like an imaginary point here. And if you breathe lightly after you've felt it a couple of times, you can still feel it. 
sort of notice where this point is. It's actually sort of right in front of your, your heart. So it's almost like, and now, so this is the external, the finishing point of our exhale, and the finishing point of our inhale is, is just inside at that same point. And so Swami Muktananda says, we have this sort of internal and external heart with these two points. And so those two points there, if I was an animator, it'd be like these two points and it would just float up and float right into that image are what we're talking about with the Visarga, Om Namah Shivaya. Those two points really represent the path of internal, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside. These two Shiva and Shakti points we're constantly being, there's a constant pulsation between that creates all of manifestation. You breathing in and out is why you're alive. And as far as I can understand it in the yogic tradition, that pulsation that we call the breath is why why everything even exists that manifestation uh, pulses in a way called that we describe as spanda that this pulsation of experience is really the reality that we're trying to describe and so we've got these two points and the two points seem like oh these are the these are two important points but it's not actually about the two points it's about the pulsation of the breath between them and so when we hold our awareness in the heart and you feel the breath come and go, you're able to identify your awareness, not just with this one physical point of the heart, but with the pulsation of life, which seems to revolve around it. So the Visarga is the nature of Shakti. So life manifestation shakti is expressing itself in the same manner as this visarga sanskrit so amazing it it literally philosophy is integrated into the way they write and speak about what they're talking about so we are going to pause at that point and now we're going to sit with that but this is sort of a glimpse of some of the benefits of working with the more, what would you say, elaborate interpretations? I don't know, um, but there's, it's just, there's a lot of benefit. It just sort of unfolds. Any questions or comments before we meditate together? Question here? You can just turn that on and talk question slash comment um in the last paragraph it's and and i'm i'm not sure so correct me if i'm wrong it seems like it's telling you to focus on the center of the body in the case of prana and wait wait scroll back up um and that was the exhalation so it's saying when you exhale focus inside at the heart and then the reverse it says for apana which is the inhale to focus can you just read the part you're talking about just read it like but i'm literally oh well i, so can, I know where you're at the the last paragraph down here by like fixation it, what mind, surprised me okay. is that it was the reverse of what i would have thought do you know what i'm talking about yeah the exhale is associated with this point or no 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 that's what i thought based on the beginning but it's saying the opposite in the last paragraph if i'm understanding correctly because it, it's saying focus on the center of the body focus on the inside in the case of prana which was the exhalation mm. so it's the reverse center of the body in the case of prana in the form of the exhalation prana and then focus on the dwada shanta which was the 12 fingers thing 
in the case of apana, which was the yeah, that is a little opposite. So, but it's really cool because we work with backwards breathing a lot. But I just uh, was surprised that that's what it was telling us. Yeah. And I wanted to hear your comments on that. Well, I in working with this, I have really tried to respect what I feel like I've been given numerous times by Babaji in the in the form of like a breath meditation where I found myself like going in and out to this point. And I feel like I'm like, have I ever heard Babaji teach me to exhale and and, and let my awareness go out totally? And this is a big yeah, yeah, right. And inhale, focus out here though. So yeah, so I guess from then, then when I looked at the reps translation and it seemed like he was, consistently bringing the awareness like you said bringing the awareness to the end of the inhale and to the be to the moment before the exhale so i was like oh he wants me to be in the heart the whole time uh so i allow but you should experiment right it wasn't that the word in the text these practices are for each of us like all i'm doing is a little bit of extra groundwork you know i think it should be either you know you should we're, look, you see the text there. That's the real text as translated. You know, it's coming from a good source. And if that's what comes through to you, do it and make, you know, feel how it works. Because we all sort of know we have a baseline, you know, like we have a teacher and we have teaching. So we know what we're going for. So if it helps you go inside, then that's it. But thanks. You know, having looked at that, I was like, oh, yeah. I, it did get confusing. I see a question from Chaitanya. Yeah, I think uh, the emphasis from Paul Rex's interpretation in this one seems to be at the, as Babaji says, at the turning point where the breath finishes and restarts, whether inhalation or exhalation. But it's a very technical, I think, interpretation that we just see here from Jayadeva Singh, where the effect of apana is a downward force in the body. And the effect of prana is an uplifting force in the body. The apana vayu, as they say, is something that tends to push down. Maybe that's the interpretation that is being worked with here. Just a thought, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, I I I am enjoying the whole conversation. Yeah. What I think is really fun in that moment is just the highlight, the moment of saying like, "Oh, there's a there's a direction of 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 force," as you put it, between the two parts of the breath, and that they do flow differently. Um. And to just feel the whole pathway of that force, you know, where does it start? Where does it end? We take it for granted. But when you were speaking and I was breathing with it, I was like, well, this is really enjoyable to just be able to feel almost like the breath for the first time. And that downward force of the inhale and then we know that there's this tendency to become externalized by the exhale and so as Abaya was saying the focal point of of keeping your attention in the heart as you exhale so in a way you can see both of these forces the inhale has this though it may begin down here at the Dwara outside of us Dwara Shanta it has an downward and inward force. And then the exhale, as the Jai Deva Singh interpretation is saying very literally, though it may be going out, we keep our focus focus here in the heart and sort of feel it go out. We don't go out with it. And as we know, when when you can sort of keep yourself in the heart and feel the exhale, 
moving it is an experience of what i what i feel like babaji describes as surrender it's an experience of consciously letting something go instead of pushing it out or attaching to it and going out with it so let's just ride that wave just got about five or eight minutes left in class. Just sort of ride the wave. Of noticing this downward and inward force of the inhale, apana. And then as you exhale, keeping your awareness in the heart letting the breath go you know where it's going but you can sort of feel where it where it turns and you keep your awareness in the heart but feel its path can really feel your awareness pooling in the heart. It's as if there's a, a stream or a, a waterfall with that apana vayu, that downward force or that downward just trajectory. And then as the exhale occurs, it's it's sort of easy to, to, to feel in that pool of awareness. It's easy to allow the exhale to go and to keep your awareness in that space where they, where's that turn, that space between the two breaths. And though we didn't talk about it directly yet, bringing the mantra hum to the inhale and sa to the exhale will be a big part of this dharana as we practice with it. And so feel free to incorporate that with your breath. Allow your effort to be less each time you breathe, focusing less on the moving 
movement of the breath and more on that focal point, that space between them, that space of the heart. Radiant one, this experience may dawn between two breaths. After breath comes in, down, just before turning up, out. The beneficence. Thank you all so much for your time and awareness tonight. Namaste. If you don't mind, hang on for just 30 more seconds. Um, we had just a quick uh, couple announcements to make. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm trying to look at you, but the camera's over here. Um, I just wanted to announce that tomorrow, I know that's not a lot of... Um, advance notice but tomorrow our dance of shakti training starts it's like a creative sequencing it kind of embodies what yogita was talking about just like really feeling the breath feeling the body being present inside um, and if you don't know what i'm talking about you can come to the first class for free to check it out so that's tomorrow and then a week from saturday 200 hour training starts and that's going to run on Saturdays and you can also come to the first day of that for free to check it out um, so email me or Satyam if you're interested in either of those opportunities 